join me to greet with a big applause to our Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. Let me give you this. This is for you. Thank you. Uh, time flies when you enjoy yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Vertheim, for your uh, very kind words. It, it is a pleasure to be back in Argentina. Uh, in the first uh, time ever that an Israeli prime minister uh, comes to Argentina uh, as prime minister, or comes to any country south of the United States, which is actually astounding when you think of it. So obviously it's a, uh, it's a new age uh, in our relations with uh, the world, our relations with Latin America, and not by accident. I chose to begin it here at the kind invitation of my friend Mauricio Macri. He is transforming uh, Argentina, and I think we're transforming together uh, the friendship between our countries. It has uh, solid foundations because we're both democracies, because we have a vibrant Jewish community, and also because we have a keen interest in seizing the future. Uh, the future belongs to those who innovate. Israel is an innovation nation. The power of innovation is endless. New industries are created from thin air, literally. Uh, they create wealth very rapidly. If you looked at the 10 leading companies in the world in terms of market capitalization 10 years ago, five were energy companies. One, only one, was IT, Microsoft. 10 years later, one energy company has left Exxon in this list. It went from number one to number five. And five are IT companies. The power of the mind is the new wealth. The combination of big data, connectivity, and artificial intelligence creates industries never heard of. This is a transformation that will change virtually every field of human endeavor. The distinction between high tech and low tech is rapidly disappearing in everything. In sewage, water, milk, I just counted three liquids. But in anything, in agriculture, in transportation, in health, everything. Everything is changing very, very rapidly. The future belongs to those who innovate. And therefore, this uh, meeting, this uh, uh, event today marks this change in our ability to cooperate. So I want to make it clear that we welcome all uh, Argentinian companies to come to Israel with uh, uh, the deputy president and subsequently later on in the second half of the year with the president and all Israeli companies to come to Argentina and share the ability to produce value. Uh, I think this is evident for anyone dealing in business. It's not evident for anyone dealing with governments. Governments typically do not think that wealth is created by the private sector. They think that wealth is created by governments. But it's not. It's just spent by governments. To create value, you need entrepreneurs. And to create entrepreneurs, you need Freedom. Freedom. Freedom from bureaucracy, freedom from overregulation, freedom from excessive taxes. This is an important message that I don't need to bring to the president of Argentina because he understands it perfectly. Now, Israel, as you know, uh, overcame many odds, but it could not achieve the growth that it has achieved today or have the companies that are represented here and many that are not, if it didn't make a substantive change. And that change was the product of a crisis, which I'd like to tell you about. We had a severe economic crisis in the year 2002-2003. Uh, and um, at that time, I had the great misfortune of being uh, appointed finance minister. Not a good job to have. 
in any time, but especially in a time of crisis. And I, um, uh, I came into the Israeli government when uh, our economy was shrinking. Uh, we had tremendous unemployment, about 11 or 12 percent. That was very high for us. We had a major bank on the verge of collapse. We had uh, uh, all the uh, uh, many businesses closing down. And there, was, uh, there were basically two explanations that were common at the time in Israel about why we were in this crisis. One was, both of them were self-evident. The first was that the Nasdaq bubble from which Israel was uh, enjoying itself uh, had burst, collapsed. The second is that we had terror. And surely these two factors contributed to our economic crisis. But I didn't think that they were really that important. They were important, but on a secondary level. I thought something else was the problem. And I had about three weeks as finance minister to present a plan to the uh, uh, Israeli public. And I'm telling you this because over lunch I told this to uh, uh, Mauricio uh, Macri. And I'll share with you what I told him, what I told the Israeli public then. I said um, that to explain the problem that we had, I described my first day in uh, basic training in the Israeli paratroopers, Sam Khanim. And uh, <clears throat> the commander put us all on a big uh, uh, parade ground. And he put us in a straight line. And he said, he pointed to the first man in the line, that was me. He said, you, Netanyahu, take the guy, look to the guy on your right, put him on your shoulder. And then he said to the man further right, put the guy next to you on your shoulder, and so on. And then he said, we're going to have a special race. He blew the whistle. It was called the elephant race. And I had somebody about my size, it was pretty heavy and I could take a few steps. The guy next to me was the smallest man in the company and had the biggest guy in the company on his shoulders. He collapsed on the spot. And the third guy had a, was a big guy, had a little guy on his shoulders and he took off like a rocket and won the race. I said in the international economy, all national economies are pairs of a public sector sitting on the shoulders of a private sector. And in our case, are you cheering for the fat man or for the thin man? <laughs> in our case, the guy at the top, the public sector, got too fat. And we were about to collapse like the guy next to me. So we had to do three things. First, we had to put the fat man, the public sector, on a diet very difficult to do politically, okay? The second thing is we had to strengthen the guy at the bottom. We had to give him a lot of oxygen uh, in his lungs so he could carry the load. How do you give oxygen? What is it that you need? The first thing that you need, lower taxes. Lower taxes. It's the first thing that you need, okay? Now we have, assuming we did that, which is very hard to do, you trim, you put the fat man on a diet, and you lower taxes. You cut spending, and you lower taxes, and everything is ready. Now you have this athlete, he has a relatively uh, smaller public sector on his uh, shoulders, and he can run and win the race, right? Wrong. Because he starts to run and he hits a ditch. He crosses the ditch and he hits a wall. He climbs the wall and he hits a fence. These are called barriers to competition, barriers to the race. So you have to remove them. So you have to do three things. Control public spending or reduce them, lower taxes, and reduce barriers to competition. This is in fact what we did. And we moved from roughly 1% negative growth to about 5% within a year. One year. And we stayed on that course basically for the rest of the time with the exception of 2008 between 4 and 5% growth. 
This is easy to say, very, very hard to do. There are uh, oligopolies, there are monopolies, there are vested interests, there is bureaucracy. There's every reason in the world not to do this unless you have this conviction inside. I see that conviction in President Macri. This is why I think Argentina has a great future, a great future. And it could grow very rapidly and achieve things that were unimaginable. We in Israel are doing this. I want you to know what we're doing. Technology by itself does not do it. You can have enormously gifted people in technology. You can have the greatest scientists, and you can have the greatest mathematicians, and you can have the greatest physicists. I'll tell you one country that had them. It's called the Soviet Union. Didn't do much, did it? But if you took one of these physicists and you brought him to Palo Alto, then within three weeks he's producing tremendous value. Remember that the basic addition of value in an economy is given by the private sector. Unless you couple free markets, or I should say freer markets, with technology, technology alone does not work. This is the fundamental change that we made in Israel. We couple technological capabilities with freer markets. This is what I think can be done here as well. In Israel, this means that we create new industries from scratch. Once you have that environment, I'll give you an example. Israel produces more milk per cow than any other cow in the world. You think it would be a French cow, Dutch cow, an American cow? No, it's an Israeli cow because it's a computerized cow. Every moo is computerized. We uh, recycle 87% of our wastewater. The next country to recycle, second country in the world is Spain with 17%. We, are, we have 20% of the world's global investment in private cybersecurity, 20%. Since we're one-tenth of one percent of the world population, this means we're punching 200 times above our weight. It's as if Israel were a country of 1.6 billion people. It's not. We have a car industry today. We never had one, but we have now a car industry. You use Waze? Yeah? Okay. Waze is an Israeli company. It was sold to Google for a mere one billion dollars. Very stupid deal. It's worth a lot more. But now, now we have a company in Jerusalem that was sold for, uh, to uh, Intel for $15 billion for autonomous vehicles. And we have 500 tech startup companies that receive each year $3.5 billion regular investment for automotive technology because transportation is changing. Transportation is changing. 85% of the value of the car within 10 years will be in software. Not in the body, not in the chassis, not in the wheels, not in the engine, but in the software. Cars are moving platforms for software. And so we're moving into that. And I can tell you on this, as opposed to cyber, we had nothing to do with it. We didn't do anything. It happened by itself. By itself. If you create the right business environment. And the same thing is happening in anything. When you have drones looking at fields and you have agriculture that is suited to the plant, the plant, not the field, the plant, you can actually water and fertilize up to the level of individual plants and reduce your spend, your cost to produce crops and enormously increase productivity and so on, and so on, and so on. You can make uh, your agriculture more productive, your air cleaner, your water more efficient and cleaner, everything, your health. We're now engaging in a digital health project in Israel. We have 98% of the population in a computerized record that every person has with a little card, and you know what their medical record is for the last 20 years. 
This is an enormous, enormous big data possibility. We're now going to take 100,000 of these people and we're going to uh, give them a genetic test, you know, a swab. And then we're going to take 2,000 of these people and we're going to put sensors on them to monitor their physical activity. So we now have a database of the entire population going down with medical records, going down to genetic composition, going down to physical performance. I don't know what this will yield, but I think, practically speaking, that this can produce both preventive medicine and personalized medicine, and many, many, many companies that will develop from this. Every field is becoming technologized. The confluence of big data, connectivity, and artificial intelligence is creating vast wealth and vast opportunities to improve life for people in Israel, for people in Argentina, for people in the Arab world, for people in Africa, for people in Latin America, for people anywhere. I think that we should have a partnership in seizing the future. This is what I came to Argentina for, and this is what I leave Argentina with. President Macri and I decided to join hands and deliver to our peoples the future they deserve. But in the end, we're just politicians. You have to do the job, and I trust you will. I can tell you that uh, one day, the great uh, futurologist, uh, Herman Kahn, in the 1960s, uh, was giving a lecture to engineers. And the lecture was, he showed the power of computation, and he, saw, he said the cost of computer uh, a unit of computation would go down like this geometrically. You know all this, Moore's Law and so on. Well, Herman Kahn described it, okay. And he said, first, now it's here, and in 10 years it will be here, and in 20 years it will be here. And one of the engineers got up and he was very angry. He said, that's easy for you. You just say it, we have to do it. Well, I'm saying it, you have to do it. Good luck, thank you very much, thank you. See you in Israel. Tadaba. Thank you.